Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin. Asyhadu an la ilaha illallah wahduhu la syarika lah wa asyhadu anna Muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Peace be unto you. We want to welcome our friends in South Africa, the United States and around the world. to this week's edition of a conversation with El Hajj Mori Salah Khan. I am pleased to be your host coming to you once again through the Salah Media platform out of Johannesburg, South Africa. Salah Media is an online portal for humanitarian journalism. We don't just report the news, we advise you on what you can do about it. Our topic for today is a grassroots conversation on the crisis in occupied Palestine. The special guests Amir Abdul Malik Ali, attorney Mohammed Bashir, and Imam Yusuf Rios. Uh, before we get started with the conversation, I want to share some verse that came to mind on May 19th uh, during Israel's latest genocidal assault on Gaza. I titled it What Would Malcolm Say? A salute to our martyr aka Black Shining Prince El Hajj Malik El Shabazz Malcolm X on his birthday. What would my tribal and ideological father say if he were alive today? What would he say about the silence of the lands? the Arab and Muslim world's cowardly lands in the face of imperialism's onslaught on Palestine? What would he say about the black politicians of muted voice and their congressional black caucus of unmitigated shame? What would Malcolm say about the hypocrisies of America's political left and its lion-hearted progressives on anything and everything except Israel and Palestine? What would he say about the political right and all of its deeply entrenched, self-righteous and immoral contradictions? One of the sons of Malcolm would really like to know. And with that said, without any further ado, I want to welcome our guests to today's conversation no need for uh, an extensive intro on these brothers they have all been with us uh, on more than one occasion in the past uh, amir abdul malik ali is based in oakland california uh, a highly respected uh, muslim leader out there on the west coast um, our brother uh, muhammad bashir Uh, is a retired attorney, but once an attorney, you're always uh, an advocate. <laughs> and uh, he's a businessman, and uh, he's been doing some stellar work here based in the Washington, D.C. area. And um, my brother, Yusuf Rios, he's, uh, he's based in the Windy City of Chicago. And he is a scholar uh, and an outspoken brother, and we are just pleased to have all three of these brothers with us again for this very important conversation on the crisis in Palestine. Welcome, my brothers. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. Wa alaikum assalam. Wa alaikum I think the first thing that we should point out is that despite the fact that there is a quote unquote official ceasefire, it's not over. Uh, just hours after the announced ceasefire, in fact, following Salat to Juma, uh, Friday prayers, a contingent of Israeli police stationed next to Al-Aqsa, uh, the Al-Aqsa compound, came into the compound and started using crowd control measures once again, including stun grenades, smoke bombs, and tear gas. It's, it's not over. Um, my opening question to each of you brothers is, is, is a question that I just want a very Uh, a singular response, either a yes or no, the opening question. And then we'll get into some uh, questions that you will be able to expound uh, upon. The opening questions, 
And by the end, yes or no answer. Is the state of Israel a colonial settler state? What say you, Abdul Malik Ali? Yes. Imam Yusuf Rios. Yes. Muhammad Bashir. Yes. Is it an apartheid state? Yes. 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 Is it guilty of ethnic cleansing and genocide? Yes. 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 Okay. Now, I'm going to give you something that each one of you can expound upon in the same order, inshallah. What are your thoughts? on the latest conflagration in occupied Palestine and and what should the Muslim response be to this latest flare-up we don't want this to be just a discussion about you know the terrible things that are being done in, in occupied Palestine the crisis on its many different uh, levels we want to have some some rich discussion along the lines of what can Muslims do what can Muslims and other you know, uh, uh, right-minded people, committed Muslims and right-minded folk of, of other persuasions. What can we do to make a difference? So again, the question is, what should what should the Muslim response be to this latest flare-up? SubhanAllah. A'udhu billahi min shaitan rajeem. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. One of the things, one of the places I would like to start, um, um, Brother Salah Khan, is I would like us to um, um, first, I would like to remind ourselves that what is happening in the apartheid state of Israel is directly connected to the dismantling of the caliphate. That we, that we, that we, have, to, we have to make that connection. As soon as the caliphate was dismantled, as soon as the caliphate was destroyed, then they were able to go in, the, um, the Western colonial forces, we're able to go in and to take our lands. And so I want to start there, um, uh, inshallah, and then let the brothers um, go ahead and expound on what they want to expound upon. But this is directly related to the fact that the caliphate, when the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, became the messenger of Allah in 610 AD, from that moment on, Muslims had one leader all the way up to the 20th century. I'm not going to talk about the quality of all these leaders, but I'm talking about the fact that as soon as he became a prophet, peace be upon him, in 610 AD, their calendar, of course, we had one leader all the way up until 1924. And as soon as the caliphate was destroyed, as soon as it was dismantled, they were able to go in and, and, and occupy, occupy Palestine. So I would like to start there, inshallah. Imam Yusuf. Can you reorient me a little bit? Excuse me? Can you reorient me a little bit with the with the question? Okay. And and, and, and in fact what okay, yeah, the, the question was what are your thoughts? on this this latest blow up this this latest conflagration in occupied palestine and what in your opinion should the muslim response be to this latest flare-up and especially uh, you know well the the muslim response globally but with a special emphasis on what should we be doing here in this neck of the woods in the united states go ahead so that's a compound uh, uh, compound question, but um, I think uh, I think uh, Amir Abdul Malik he 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 segue really well into tying this into the historical reality of you know the pretty much the British Empire, and he took he took the side of the the dismantling and the collapse of the Ottoman Empire. And I, I would take the other side of that, and I would say that we have to understand clearly what system was imposed. Our political discourse as a Muslim community globally, and specifically within the Americas, 
it fails to have a, a, an open commitment to recognizing what has happened in Africa, what has happened in the Americas. So the liberation struggle of the black liberation struggle is, is where the Muslims are disconnected. It. And they can't, they can't talk, of, we can't talk about Khilafah being dismantled without talking about the British Empire. And we can't talk about the British Empire without talking about the other empires that came before. And we can't talk about any of those issues without talking about transatlantic slavery <clears throat> and the dismantling of, uh, of indigenous civilizations. Because the settler state, the reason why there's no response coming from the West is because they did the same thing. And so and no, if they were to recognize that there's an actual problem in Israel, then they would have to recognize that there was an actual problem with the African diaspora. So the Muslim community itself has to remove this ideological position that it has taken on Islamophobia, which decides to uh, carve out race as a factor of analysis, put it to the side and say, we're just being religiously discriminated against. And so we want to be part of the society so don't discriminate against us because you're you know if you discriminate against us religiously it's not being fair but we're not going to talk to talk about the racial question so when you you know i think that our analysis not necessarily people in this group but in general as a community is off the the language has changed though the language of the settler state you know that type of language the language of the apartheid state that brings us right back into the system of white supremacy. Mm -hmm. It brings us right back to Eurocentricity. And the Muslims fa are failing to, to deal with that question. We would have to deal with it anyway, because if we were to get a political state as Muslims, then what will be the position of the non-Muslim? Will we repeat the same drama? <clears throat> you know what I'm saying? So these are questions that we have to tighten up on. And I think that on the, on the grassroots level, we have to organize better and realize the intersectionality that people are scared of that word of all of the Muslim dilemmas, whether it's Yemen, whether it's India, you understand what I'm saying? And, and uh, we have to see how those things are tied into Palestine. And then we have to see how Colombia is tied into this, you know, how the African American struggle is tied into this, how these struggles are really interconnected either in policy or in similarity, just like when we look as a reference point to South Africa, and I'll tone down on this point, South Africa is telling us that there was a race-based problem. So if we're saying that Israel is a race-based problem also, you know, and, and we're saying that America, the U.S. specifically is a race-based problem and India is a race-based problem, you know, then we, we, we have to refine our, our thoughts. So we, I think, have to be more adamant and making sure our language is understood clearly and that the policy reflects an understanding of our language. The foreign policy right now is continuously perpetuating a system, you know, which no one wants to criticize. And, and that is the settler state, you know, that is the United States, unfortunately. And, that, and that's the challenge that we're in, that, you know, the United States is continuing perpetuating a settler state mentality. Brother Muhammad, what does your legally trained mind suggest around this question? Are you mute, muted, brother? Yeah, I am. Alhamdulillah. Okay. Bismillah. Sound like to all the brothers. First of all, I love these brothers. I love listening like to them. And because, you know, it's, it's unique. I find myself in a unique position right now because I agree with everything that was said before me. Um, mm -hmm. When you're an advocate, you're always looking for the nuance of where you can put your argument, but I'm not going to. I'm just going to put it in, in my lane and hopefully everybody or at least someone will appreciate it. What the brothers just described to you with the dismantling of the caliphate, taking it back to race to the white supremacy is exactly what you see in Israel. And the question then becomes where in fact did this particular concept that we are not willing to address, not willing to uh, uh, wrap our around as Muslims because we are locked up into this concept of Islamophobia. Uh, where, when are we going to recognize that this has predated us and it's a continuum? Manifest destiny, if you take the, the concept of manifest destiny 
and you lock it into what Israel is doing right now. They are basically saying that we have a divine right, right. to the land there. That's exactly what the Catholic Church said in 1300, and when they uh, in, in the 1400, 14th century, when they were sending out uh, uh, what they considered to be explorers, when they really were conquistadors and they were really conquerors, etc. That we have a right by virtue of faith, our religion, our church. And they put it into the law and they made it part and parcel of the law and they made it part and parcel of every place that they set their foot at that if they put their flag down that they had a divine right this is the exact argument that israel is making or trying to make or at least trying to propagandize to the world that somehow they have a divine right so the question then becomes look around as the imam said look around to places like colombia look at places like brazil look at places like Central America, look at Africa and look and see what is the consistency, especially as Muslims, because again, we cannot lock ourselves into some isolated incident as opposed to checking out the entire continuum because we'll miss the entirety of the picture. One of the things that we don't do here in America is we don't respect what's commonly referred to as quote unquote black scholarship mm -hmm. or black thought. So even though we praise Malcolm, we don't really respect the thought process that brought about a mountain. So let me mm -hmm. throw out a scholar to you. Neely Fuller, Neely Fuller who writes the, uh, the, the, the contemporary code on racism. He says, if you don't understand racism and white supremacy, everything that you think you know about this society and this culture will only serve to confuse you. And so I say that if you go back right now, just start marching back, you go from Israel and its occupation and its apartheid state and you go then to south africa and it's mm -hmm. apartheid state you can go to nazi germany and its mm -hmm. concept of racism white supremacy you go back to american settler colonialism here in the united states because all of these particular racist white supremacist states borrow from what happened here in the americas and what happened with the transatlantic slavery and what happened with the <laughs> co-signing a manifest destiny through the Catholic Church that sent all these credence out into the world to destroy and conquer. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that. Yeah. A Gaza physician recently stated uh, publicly that Israel, in its latest assault, targeted doctors and health facilities <laughs> to overwhelm the crumbling healthcare system. Uh, uh, in, in Gaza, as well as other parts of Gaza's life-sustaining infrastructure. Mm -hmm. You know, it's water purification system, it's, it's sewage system, the power grid. I mean, they only had a number, a, a limited number of hours each day of power uh, as it was before the assault. Uh, untold thousands of Palestinians have been left homeless in the largest open air prison in the world. Now, against that backdrop, someone brought to my attention um, an organization that I was not aware of. And they, they, the brother brought it to my attention to ask my opinion of it. From time to time, he does this. He brings very, very valuable information to my attention that uh, he feels that I should uh, be aware of or, or he will want my, my perspective on. And he wanted my perspective on this because of how he was leaning at the time. I uh, ended up, uh, I, I read it, it blew me away. It really blew me away. And I ended up sending it to each one of you. And I hope, but I, I sent it yes, early yesterday. I hope that you got a chance to get into it and, and, and you'll be able to share some opinion on it because it, it <laughs> from my perspective, it is one, uh, it is situated as it has positioned itself to be one of the heavy hitters on the propaganda front for Zionism in the United States. It, it, the organization is called uh, the Zionist Movement. I sent it to you all, linked to you all yesterday, and I encourage you to take a look at it before today's uh, program. I'm going to just read uh, uh, a passage from it and then invite each of you to weigh in on uh, this uh, organization with your opinion. Zionists 
Zionists is a coalition of Jewish activists and allies who are unabashedly progressive and unapologetically Zionist. We are a grassroots organization with more than 30 chapters across the country fighting for the advancement of social, racial, economic, environmental, and gender justice in America. We are also committed to fighting for Zionism and the inclusion of Zionism in social justice spaces because Zionism is itself a progressive value. The movement for liberation and national self-determination of the Jewish people in our indigenous homeland. Now, uh, beginning with you, uh, Amir Abdelmalik Ali, did you get a chance uh, to, to, to go uh, through this uh, website, the link to the website uh, that I sent you and, and, and read what all they have to say about themselves and their agenda. And, and if so, what are your thoughts? I think you're muted again, Aki. Can you hear me? I can hear you now, yes. Um, I didn't get a chance to, uh, to read it, but when you were reading it just now, it reminded me of it reminded me of Malcolm when Malcolm said that one of the things that Zionists tried to do is to give Zionism a pretty face to make Zionism look like a liberation movement, right? And that's what they're doing right here. They're 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 trying to um, make it a part of the so-called left, if you will, um, and give Zionism a pretty face and make Zionism um, a, a part of a, a, a legitimate liberation struggle. That's a lie. It's a lie. And, and one of the things that we have to do is we have to destroy, when you asked earlier, what can we do here? One of the things we have to do is destroy their narrative. And it's very easy to destroy their narrative because their narrative is rooted in falsehood. And the law says when truth comes, it smashes the brains out of, out of falsehood. So it's a narrative that's rooted in falsehood. It's a narrative that's rooted, as the brothers said earlier, in when they took the concept of chosen people and they fused it with white supremacy. That's what they did. Chosen people and white supremacy were fused together, all right? Um, and so now they see that world public opinion is shifting dramatically against the apartheid state of Israel. And so now what they're trying to do is they're trying to, um, you know, they're trying to do damage control, right? Which is not going to work. The only people who will accept them are the people who have sold out and the people who are not truly grassroots, right? But that's not gonna go anywhere. It's not gonna go anywhere because again, it's rooted in falsehood. And so what we have to do is destroy that narrative. We have to destroy that narrative that the Palestinian people themselves are, are, are the aggressor, right? Are not being occupied, right? That they are Goliath and the Israelis are David. We have to destroy their entire narrative. That's what we have to do. And we have the momentum. The momentum is not on their side. That's why they're doing desperate things like that, silly things like that, because they know that the momentum is shifting and the momentum is not on their side. Alhamdulillah. Brother Muhammad, let me, let me come back to you uh, first with a, with a response, and then uh, we'll come to uh, uh, the, the Imam. Uh, Muhammad, your response to that. And did you get a chance to read it, Aki? Yes, I did get a chance to read it. Alhamdulillah. Uh, thank you for sending it to me. I read it, and then I went and I washed my hands uh, <laughs> because it was absolutely <laughs> disgusting, and I didn't want to have any, any connection to it. And and here's why. It's it Shek it's it's Abdul Malik. Here's why. You are 100% right when you say that this is like their propaganda and the connection between Manifest Destiny and, and the whole concept of the chosen people, etc., connecting it to white supremacy. This is what they attempted to do. But they, I mean, they are even more insidious. What they did was, if you read the language of it, they literally adopt the language of the civil rights movement. They literally borrow from the struggle of Black America as a way of infusing uh, 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 this, this white supremacy narrative into the struggle of, of, of black people here in America. And I can literally remember, um, who was it, uh, Boehner, uh, uh, a staunch conservative, staunch public as, as, as a Republican, uh, staunch white man, staunch racist, as Malcolm would say, to paraphrase him. Quote, saying that you need to judge people by the color of their skin, by the content of their character, not by the color of their skin. Adopting Martin Luther King as a way of mm -hmm. suppressing the vote back in 2009, 2010. The attack, the way they constantly steal from 
the community as a way of saying, if, if we can just hit these themes, that would be enough for people to back off because we say we are the ones who are standing for justice. We are standing for right. So they throw in all of the, the, the language of the civil rights activists, the civil rights movement, the rights for justice being sought out here, especially at a time now where people are mobilized around George Floyd, where people are beginning to see, or at least trying to connect the dots from today to yesterday, you know, so they adopt all of the language there and try to pawn it off as if it's theirs. But they can't get away from one thing, no matter how hard they try, and they try it really hard. They keep trying to conflate Judaism with Zionism. Zionism mm -hmm. has already been determined by the UN to be racist. That's right. Judaism cannot be racist. The faith cannot be racist. All right. So then the two can't mm -hmm. be compatible. But that's what they t constantly try to do. So when you read lines that say um, a Jewish homeland uh, and Zionism, you know, you're talking about two things that are totally inconsistent with each other. And therein mm -hmm. lies their problem. And, and that's part and parcel, in my opinion, of the narrative that we have to strike down, that the faith that they people who have accepted Judaism as being their faith is not consistent with racism and Zionism and apartheid, which are three three fingers on the same hand. Yeah, alhamdulillah. Uh, and then before we go to um, uh, Imam Yusuf for, for his response, I want to say something that came to mind as, uh, uh, as, as you were responding to this uh, question, brother. One of the things that I've noticed over the years, and the first time I noticed it, I mean, it really jumped out at me. The first time I noticed it was when I was in Boston uh, for an annual conference um, that featured as the keynote speaker on one of the three days of the conference. Uh, former, uh, the late uh, former uh, uh, Archbishop Emeritus Desmond Tutu uh, uh, of South Africa. He was the keynote speaker. And this annual conference took place at the Old South Church. This is one of the oldest uh, and, 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 and most well-known and respected religious institutions in America. It goes all the way back to colonial times, the Old South Church. Uh, they had this annual uh, uh, Palestine-oriented uh, conference. I'll never forget. And it was very well attended by people from different parts of the country and around the world. That was very well attended all three days. But the thing that also stood out about this conference was it had, there was a, a large, a very large demonstration, a protest demonstration against the conference and against the Old South Church for being the host of the conference outside all three days. And this demonstration was led by Christian and Jewish Zionists. And one of the things that really stood out for me, you know, that I stood outside and I, I read some of the placards and listened to some of the rhetoric that was being uh, 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 trumped, uh, trumpeted uh, through the loudspeakers. They were using, I mean, they had images and some of the quotes of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. All right, supporting Israel, supporting Zionism, and just recently, I just I saw uh, on one of the uh, in, 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 in one of the Facebook groups, see the boy, the boycott Israel or Zionism, uh, um, uh, the uh, the the uh, protest Zionism uh, group. Some Zionists weighed in with a quote from Dr. King. Uh, supporting Zionism. And my response to that uh, uh, that quote when it was uh, posted was that uh, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. of 1967-68 would have had a very different view on Zionism. You know, that had to have been an earlier quote from earlier years. When he was not as well informed uh, 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 on what Zionism was, but I am certain that the 
if if the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. of 1967, 68 were alive today, his position would have been the same as it was against the Vietnam War. And and, and I say this as a challenge to the to black civil rights folk in this country to step up and to stop allowing the Zionists to use Dr. King in this manner, the legacy of Dr. King, the memory of Dr. King in this manner. This is a challenge for those who claim to be uh, on the path of, of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And who, and who claim to hold him up. You gotta challenge the way that he is being used by these, uh, these, 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 white supremacists, these, these bigots, these, these uh, ge genocidal maniacs who are committing outrageous uh, crimes uh, against humanity and trying to use Dr. King as a cover. Now, with that said, uh, 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 Imam, uh, you, you weigh in on, on this, inshallah ta'ala. Your thoughts? I, I didn't get a on, chance on that, to... On that Zionist organization. Did you, you didn't read it? No, I didn't, I didn't get a chance okay. to, to be honest with you. I didn't... Okay. Uh, there was a brother who had uh, he had posted a picture of a young child that lost their family. Uh, you know, I mean, she lost her family, and I was in the midst of counseling a Palestinian family at the same time, and I, I just had to go to sleep, you know, because yeah. of the the, yeah. the destruction. Yeah. You know, I'm, yeah. And I, I mean, I can make some comments in general on some points that are there. Uh, mm -hmm. But that's up to you how you want to navigate that one. Yeah, yeah, please, please wait, just weigh in on what you heard, that quote that I shared I, and what our, our, our other esteemed brothers had to say. I think, Your I thoughts. think that, I think that, uh, I think that a lot of the points that were made, there, there's a tremendous amount of synergy between us. And I think that it opens up to what uh, Noam Chomsky had said and it brings us back to our reality once again. Noam Chomsky had made the point that uh, Christian Zionism gives the impetus to uh, to a lot of the what is associated with Jewish Zionism, and and it gives it its cover. And so Christian fundamentalism that's coming out of a specifically uh, the Protestant Church in today's time. And we see it all in the Americas, you know, the, the, is, is what is ideologically supporting this. Or else, if there was no rootedness in this idea of Jesus coming back on these terms, this would not be allowable. You understand what I'm saying? So I think that it has to be tied in once again to the issue of white supremacy and how those discourses have reshaped liberation struggles. I'm not going to deny that the Jewish community wasn't a problem and that early Zionism had taken on a different orientation, you know, it, before it became exclusively a settler ideology, just to be fair. But I think even that, it still comes back to the question of, we're, for the sake of argument, we're willing to entertain that it was a liberation struggle, just for the sake of argument. But a liberation from what? And so if it was a liberation struggle, then it was a liberation from the problem of European society and how it navigates dealing with uh, people that it X's out, it X's their humanity out. And so part of the, even Jewish philosophers have noted the problem of the master-slave dialectic, which they borrow from Marx, they borrow from Hegel, Hegel borrowed from the Haitian Revolution, right? And the, the Haitian Revolution was when, you know, those people who were enslaved, they rose up against the so-called master and overturned the dialectic, right? Overturned the dialectic of their having to be a master, they having to be a slave. Because that's the, that's the problem that we have here, is that they're continuously justifying their dialectic. So, the, so part of that Jewish community, which has internalized this type of Zionism, we're not going to necessarily, for the sake of argument, negate that you had a liberation show, but you have internalized that master save dialectic. You have not resolved that. And it was the same problem you had in Nazi Germany, right? 
And so then it becomes the, something that you want to institute and implement in another part of the world and label it a liberation struggle. And you want us to ethically write off on that. So, it, so if it was a problem in Nazi Germany for them, then what justifies it in another situation? And so that's where the ARP, apartheid reality of South Africa really teaches us that when we start dismantling these systems, there's real effects that still have to be mitigated. That when we start talking about really dismantling apartheid structures, racist structures, that it's not just going to be something which is theoretical. And it's just like in this society when segregation in the literal sense, not in necessarily in the subtle legal sense, but in the sense of you can't drink here or you can't be here. When that was dismantled, it doesn't mean that it went away. And so I think that this is the, the, the same thing that when we talk about the Jewish question, that the Jewish question for, you know, what it meant in European society, the problem was not resolved. So there's an inherent internal contradiction in Western society, which the Muslims, Malcolm said it best, Rahmatullah. He said, Islam can address this problem. But the Muslims themselves have not internalized those principles so that it becomes a revolutionary principle to transform this dynamic which exists in these legal systems and these civilizational outlooks and these definitions of humanity. Because really what we're talking about is, 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 uh, is the same problem that we see, you know, philosophically that's there in, is in black thought. You know, we're still talking about who's the human being. We're not, you know, we're basically still justifying the concept that we're not all human beings. You, 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 so, so as long as we have this idea in law, which we're not acknowledging people as full human beings, we're not going to go anywhere ideologically. The legal system has to change as well as the, is the, is the ideology. And so the, the, what we saw in Nazi Germany, what we saw in apartheid society, what we saw in U.S. segregation, you know, is the reality which is being justified. And so Zionism, like you said, is just, a, it becomes a religious cover in this current manifestation or iteration, you know, for, for those practices on the ground. The, and, the, and so the question becomes for the activists, have we put that language out there strong enough so that people understand, you know, the ideological underpinnings? Because for whatever reason, they didn't get it in the time of Malcolm. For whatever reason, they didn't get it in the time of Mandela. For whatever reason, they didn't get it in the time when the world was going up against Nazi Germany. And we're just reliving this, but not only reliving it in Israel. This is what I want to keep emphasizing. We just watched a George Floyd case that went on for days. You understand what I'm saying? It went on for days to uh, prove that the person was innocent. You know what I'm saying? George Floyd, after his death, had to prove that he was innocent. That's that's real. We're still on the same discussion on who's the human being. And that this is where I challenge the Muslims because we're failing on this front. Muslims have internalized the same racial structures and classifications and categorizations and haven't lived up to the legacy of Malcolm. Or further than that, the legacy of the prophet and dismantling uh, this type of, of system. And we're not talking about a utopia. Here. And that's I think that's where the Muslims, the Muslims are like, they, they treat the religion from an angle of utopia. Well, yeah, there's no racism in Islam. But we're not talking about internally Islam. We're talking about an interpersonal relationship between Muslims. And we're talking about in legal systems and institutions. We're talking about manifestations of racism and prejudice, you know, and systemic injustice, which couldn't exist in the past because those mechanisms weren't there in the same way. So our analysis and our practice, you know, it has to be updated, you know, I, and I'm sorry to be a little long winded on that one. Can I say something, brother? Um, Salakan, real yes, quick. Go ahead, go ahead, brother. Yes. We have, we have to destroy that. And what I'm saying is that when they talk about, when they talk about trying to align the a Zionist movement here with the black liberation struggle, mm -hmm. it's African Americans in particular who have to destroy that narrative. We have to destroy it. And, and it's, it's, it's most likely gonna come from uh, the youth and it's most likely gonna come from the Muslims, the Muslims who do it. Ironically, Brother Salah Khan, one of the things that we're seeing 
is that the people who are embracing late 60s Dr. King, besides the youth, are some of the Muslims who are embracing late 60s Dr. King, the more activist-oriented Muslims. You know, we do have some Muslims who are still afraid, but I'm saying the more activist-oriented Muslims, those struggling in Fisa Bilala, they're embracing late 60s Dr. King. So if these people want to try to align their oppressive genocidal movement with a black liberation struggle, we have to be on the forefront to tell them, no, you can't. Every oppressed people have a test, Brother Salakan, that when, when oppressed people are not oppressed anymore and they have power, they got a test now. That test is, are they gonna become like their oppressor? Are they, mm -hmm. gonna, be, are they gonna be standard bearers for justice? What the Israelis did, they flunked the test. Yeah, they went through some serious hell over there in Germany, but when they got power, they became the oppressor. And now they want us to follow them. Any oppressed people who align themselves with an oppressor against another oppressed people forfeit their rights for justice. And so they flunked the test. So now they're trying to associate Zionism with our struggle. We have to destroy that narrative and it's got to come from us. Sorry about that. I just had to. Abdul Malik, on the, on, Abdul Malik on, on the question of aligning, of aligning ourselves with either the freedom struggle or uh, the oppressors, we want to uh, take this into a, a, another uh, another angle of, of of discussion now. Politics. Right now, there's a big race about to take place next month in New York City, one of the most important cities on the global block. Mm -hmm. uh, the two front runners are an African American and an Asian American. All right, Eric Adams and Andrew Yang. They both came out with statements that were rather damning, uh, just as the, um, the, 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 the sacrilege uh, that was, was, was going into high gear and occupied Palestine. Eric Adams, I, I don't know which one released their statement first, but this is what Eric Adams, the African-American had to say. Quote, today on Yom, Yerushalayim, uh, Yerushalayim. Uh, Israel came under attack from Hamas fired rockets in Gaza. <laughs> Israelis live under the constant threat of terrorism and war, and New York City's bond with Israel remains unbreakable. I stand shoulder to shoulder with the people of Israel during this time of crisis. Now, this is what his campaign the statement that his campaign released. The, uh, the statement that uh, the uh, Andrew Yang campaign released was, quote, I'm standing with the people of Israel. We're coming under bombardment, attacks, and condemned Hamas terrorists. The people of New York City will always stand with our brothers and sisters in Israel who face down terrorism and persevere. Now, that's the end of uh, his quote. My understanding is that uh, uh, Yang walked his back after he got hit with criticism. They both did, but Yang reportedly walked his back with an apology. I'm, I'm, uh, I, haven't, I haven't seen it. I don't know exactly what it said, but this is what I was told. He walked his back with an apology. Uh, but the African American brother uh, has not yet apologized or walked it back. Meanwhile, and this is very important. Meanwhile, there's been some uh, divisions that, uh, that have that have erupted uh, uh, among the Muslims in the city as a result of these two statements and the fallout around them. I just saw a uh, a statement released. Uh, by quote unquote Muslim grassroots leaders of African descent. All right, maintain endorsement of Eric Adams for mayor. Now I'm going to read you read you what the statement says, and then I'd like for each one of you, beginning with you, Amir Abdul Ali, to weigh in on your thoughts, your opinion of this controversy and what this particular group has had to say. The statement reads as follows. 
Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. This past Il Fitr, Eve, we were informed of the decision of some Muslim leaders and activists to withdraw their endorsement issued under the umbrella of New York Muslim Action Network of Eric Adams for Mayor 2021. As grassroots leaders, we were not part of any meeting with representatives of the candidate held prior to withdrawal of the endorsement, nor were we consulted on the agenda or talking points for any such meeting. We respect the right of those who participated in that shura or consultation to make a decision. Nonetheless, we are not bound by it. Now listen good. As Muslims, we share the moral outrage of many at both the recent and ongoing manifestations of the oppression of the Palestinian people, and indeed of all people, including our own as Muslim Americans of African descent who are NYC New York City grassroots leaders, seasoned not only as activists, but leaders of congregations, we assert our right to speak and act for ourselves on behalf of those men, women, young people, and children whom we represent. As previously stated by us, prior to our endorsement of any mayoral candidate, we evaluated them all based upon number one their relationship or lack thereof with our community as both muslims and african americans secondly their respective stances on a variety of issues and concerns impacting our underserved communities as well as the entire city and lastly our judgment of the candidates character capacity and commitment to their stated positions based upon these factors we maintain our endorsement of eric adams for new york city mayor this was the statement was issued on may 21st now before i share with you what my response was to that statement i'd like to hear what your thoughts are beginning with you um real quick because brother um brother muhammad hasn't said anything in a little while here so we need to Anyway, I'll, I'll be really quick here, um, Brother Muhammad. Um, I hope they're not doing it. I hope they're not supporting them because of race. Um, you know, I, I don't trust politicians. I don't trust them at all. I'm not surprised with um, what these politicians have said. I'm not surprised at all. And as soon as we get as soon as we get close to them and try to get really get next to them, this is the kind of fitness that it's going to cause. You know what I'm saying? They're, these people are not controlled by us. Once you get a part of that electoral system, you're not controlled by us anymore. You're not controlled by the people anymore. You're controlled by the people who control the electoral system, and that's the corrupt rich. And so I'm not, I'm not at all shocked by the fitna that this is calling, but I'll stop there, inshallah, and I'll turn it over to Brother Muhammad, inshallah. Muhammad, you're talking. Sound like I had the opportunity to, uh, maybe about 20 years ago, to meet Eric Adams, he was a member of the 100 officers um, in New York, 100 police officers to do good work or something. Um, and he impressed me as being a good brother. But I'm like uh, 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 Sheikh Abdul Malik. I don't trust any politicians because the system in and of itself controls the politician. Jamil el -Amin said that on Black It Is back in 67, you know, that <laughs> when the person in a particular position, I mean, you said that, we him are having a discussion about something that someone has outlined for us who we trust as far back as 67. So for those of those, those of us who understand, the history is probably important. First of all, they are backing him because he's black, Sheck. I'm sorry, that's the only way that, that I can describe it. And we have to stop fooling ourselves, even as Muslims, to think that we are not caught up into the emotional dynamic of what it is to be so-called blacks here in America. We didn't define ourselves as blacks here in America. White supremacy came up with the hierarchy and named people by color. Islam doesn't name you by color. It talks about character. It talks about taqwa. It talks about things like that. So if we're going to hold on to that, we need to first disregard every aspect of what white supremacy has brought to us. But secondly, we talked about the, uh, the, 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 the potential that there was a 
a bad situation. Uh, there was a Holocaust. Whoever's denying that's foolish. But the outcome of the Holocaust was that the people who were backing the Zionists, not the Jews, not the not Benny Israel, not any of those sects, the people who were backing Zionism, took the game plan from the United States, the exact same game plan, and ran it on the rest of the world. The same propaganda tool when they called the Indian savages when they went into when they used Mon, uh, the Monroe Doctrine to go into Central America. The same exact same game plan. And if you look at Israel honestly and objectively as a Muslim, you have no no compunction about condemning everything they stand for because here's what they did. 48, they were declared that they would have this particular state by the UN. And they had your, your picture, you got a picture of the land grab. At every skirmish, 56, they have as a skirmish and they see some more land. Isn't that exactly what they did with the Native American? They have a skirmish and then therefore they have to take their land. And then in 67, they have another skirmish and they annex the West Bank. Right, so they have the Suez Canal, then the West Bank, etc. And in each skirmish, what do they do? They move on the land. They don't move on. They use the people as cannon fodder to move on the land. This is exactly what the game plan that was done in the United States. This is exactly the same game plan that was done in the Dominican Republic, in what was attempted in Haiti, what has been done throughout Central America. We need to stop as Muslims dealing with our heart, because frankly, I'll tell you the truth. You said you wanted grassroots. Here it comes. We are supporting Palestine, not because they are being oppressed, but because they're Palestinian. Because if we weren't, we would be doing the same thing for Colombians. We would be doing the same thing for African-Americans. We would be doing the same thing for the Rohingya. We would be doing the same thing. We have the same statements and same arguments for all of these people. When the brother talks about the legal system, all of these legal systems are designed to support white supremacy. This is why you cannot get in the United Nations a trial on the, the, the boat shooting that happened in 2010 where Israel shot the people off the boat. You can't get a criminal charge. It's been dismissed three times. What could be more of an open crime than to shoot the people on the, coming on a boat in open air by orders of your government? You can't get it. But isn't that exactly what we are arguing here in America about uh, 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 to George Floyd, about the shootings of kids in the street? Isn't that exactly what Venezuela is arguing right now over them creating a government with Guaido as opposed to uh, a Maduro, the elected representative, it is the exact same thing. So who is going to be that particular person, group, people, who has a mandate to stand for justice, no matter who it's for or who it's against? There is no other culture, no other culture that has that as their mandate except the Muslims. So we have to put aside the fact that Eric Adams is black, put aside the fact that these people are Palestinians because we like light skin, all right? And we have to begin to stand for justice no matter who it's for or who it's against, and even if it's against ourselves. When we get to that point, then the world is going to stand back and take notice. Up until that point, we're going to be exactly like the Native Americans and exactly like the Central Americans. Okay, before we hear from uh, uh, Imam Yusuf, I just want to uh, say to the uh, viewing audience and, and to our brothers here on this panel that uh, uh, our, our brother uh, Amir Abdul Malik Ali is, is, is right now uh in in uh engages in travel he's in a hotel he's gonna have to check out so if he if he ends up uh, just uh, uh excusing himself you you understand why uh check yourself okay. may uh, uh, okay, amir, go ahead, uh amir make dua for us inshallah amir of the malik amin uh, <laughs> there's i mean there's a lot to be said to be honest with you they the, if we want to talk about really getting where we need to go, there's some hard conversations internally in our Muslim community that have to be had. And those are the same type of conversations that we have to have with uh, the Jewish community, with what we call white society. First of all, there's a number of issues. One is new york city speaking like it's a country and so this issue comes back to the fact that new york and israel have economic ties to each other when it comes to police training when it comes to intelligence sharing all of that type of stuff which you know that directly that knee on your neck technique 
that we saw with the George Floyd case, that was developed in Israel. And so, you know, that, you know, part of the problem is that a lot of these cities have major contracts, you know, with Israel and they, they share training and education. And of course, that's all unpopular stuff. You know, this is all the type of stuff that when you start talking about this, it's a problem for the system. And so that's the first layer that these cities, they have these contracts with our tax dollars that come back and impact us in two ways. It impacts the Muslim community. We're part of the Muslim community and it, it impacts us directly because our tribes are the ones that end up getting the negative uh, effects of what you know those contracts mean. Uh, those contracts mean. The other issue is that I'm not too impressed and, and, and I'm gonna say something very unpopular, but I've been talking to brothers that are on the Majesty Shota indirectly and, and all of that type of stuff. Look, the reality is that we have divisions in the Muslim community. And they're divisions that are based on, they have been based on a while on do we deal with foreign policy or we do, do we deal with domestic issues? And then we have ideological divisions. The Muslim community in, the, in, in New York played a dangerous political game. And I openly talked about that. They played a dangerously political game and the way that they were endorsing people. It just so happened that this situation with Palestine erupted at this time with the election. But like one of the imams says, this happens every year around Ramadan that they have these issues. So the Muslim community, I mentioned this before, thousands of dollars and millions of dollars have been spent on Islamophobia and building masajid, but we haven't built power. We haven't built power. So in, this, in a place like New York City, although you have, it was a center, it was a Mecca for the indigenous Muslim community and Islam overall. Because when you go back to State Street Masjid and all of that type of stuff in terms of Dawah, the Muslims have failed to have a ground in New York in the actual voice. And so there's another issue that we don't want to talk about too. When we talk about internalizing oppression, the relationship between the black and the Arab community isn't all that great. Even the way during this re these realities, there's actual skirmishes amongst us with regard to how language is co-opted from the black struggle to talk about the Palestinian struggle. But then in our inner cities, the way that we deal with each other is we undermine our own well-being. You know what I'm saying? We as a Muslim community and certain segments of the Muslim community have undermined all of the work for liberation and justice by the way that they deal with the black community. I'm, I'm just gonna put that on the table. So these things are interconnected circular, you know, in, in, in a cyclical way. And, and, and the more that you have the understanding of the dynamics and we have the language that's in place and we, and, and we are able to bring down each issue and attach it to principles, the more clear we're going to be. And, and, like, and, like, and like our lawyers said here, we don't respect black thought. And as long as we don't respect black thought, we're not going to understand dehumanization. You understand what I'm saying? We're not going to be able to get into any sort of justice struggle. And we mentioned this before. Those who were not pro-black liberation during the BLM time are not in a moral situation or in a moral position to be able to really talk about these issues as they should be talked about because they're connected when it comes to the way that cities spend money, when it comes to the way we do policing, when it comes to uh, 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 military policy, when it comes to the way that people are presented in media. Didn't Malcolm have a whole discussion on the issue of how pe people are presented in media, how they can be dehumanized and how the aggressor can be justified? So when we look at New York City, you know, our community has to, it's like we say in, this, in the street, you either about it, about it, or you're not. You know, keep keep it real. Like you're either about building power or you're not. But this this game that we're playing with politi politicians is detrimental for our health, right? It's like it's like it's like it's like the brothers were saying. But if we're going to enter the political game, we have to understand how we're going to work that. And what we're doing is we're going into the into the political game without a game plan, and we're being divided. You understand what I'm saying on issues which is not just an issue of interest like okay my community gets 10 million 
your community gets 20 million for a school. No, we're talking about the impact on life at this point, which is something, it's not the quality of life because we're in a luxurious position, but we're talking about how policing is done. We're talking about the undermining of educational systems. We're talking about justifying incarceration systems. So, you know, I'm closing with this point that we have to put pressure on ourselves to generate the language that's necessary to deal with our reality and set our goals. It just seems like we're not doing it. It seems like we're playing around with the language and we're ending up like with the process that we have now in New York. The Muslim community in New York will end up impacting Mari and Mohammed Bashir, the whole of the country, because we know that whoever impacts New York, we know the game plan. It impacts the rest of the country. It has repercussions. We should hold them accountable to having a higher standard of how they're dealing with politics. That, Absolutely. you know, it, it's, it's, not, it's not solid at this point. Absolutely. Now, let me share with you what my response was, and then I'm going to invite a, a one minute closing remark from both of you. My response when I saw the post was, while I am not a New Yorker, it is a well-known fact that I have deep and long-standing ties with the African-American and Muslim communities, both within and around the Big Apple, New York City. While I wholeheartedly agree that all representatives of the grassroots should have been consulted before any decision was made, I am nevertheless troubled by the summary conclusion of this statement. If Mr. Adams has not apologized and corrected himself on an issue that should be a red line for us all, what is it about his character, quote unquote, and the expectations standing there from that warrants continued support for his mayoral candidacy? I sincerely would like to know. With that, brothers, um, we're at the end of the program. I want to invite both of you to just take one minute, one minute to make a, a, a closing uh, remark on the topic for today. Let's begin with you, Brother Muhammad. You're, you're still muted, Aki. Can't hear you. You know, okay, I'm okay. There you how's go. that better? I can hear myself yes. now, but check Leo's. First of all, Assalamu alaikum. You know, I follow your stuff. I love uh, the energy that you bring to the community. Keep bringing it. Um, it's needed. Uh, tonight, I'm going to be, uh, and this is on topic in case you didn't know, tonight, I'm going to be on WBGR radio, uh, WBGR.com discussing, are you ready? I buried Malcolm X a book mm -hmm. I edited mm -hmm. for Haji Hisham Jabra. The reason why that became a topic and I put it on a Facebook post is because I saw a television program where the Muslims on this program were attempting to re-identify Malcolm X on his birthday, redefine him, the same kind of stuff that we see here. And again, that's the division in our particular community and we are the community. I always like to analogize our community to Musa. Musa alayhi salam is born and birthed in the house of Faroon. Reason why I believe Allah sends him, and I say I believe, so you can't chalk this up to Islam. I believe that Allah sends Musa back to them is because he knew, he was raised in that house. He knew what that house we could present. Even to the point where Musa says, basically says, oh Allah, I, you're going to have to show me something. I know what they can do. And then Allah shows him the miracles of the staff and the hand, etc. We are like that. We are built into this culture. Every culture that comes here should be looking to us, our communities, the people who have fought this struggle of trying to dismantle racism, white supremacy for the last 400 years, because it's not just local. We the ones who understand the people who hold the purse strings for all those people who are practicing it around the world. And we should be the ones in the forefront as Muslims of leading the charge against racism, white supremacy. Sure. I'm doing that. Wherever it shows up. Uh, is, is our brother uh, Imam Yusuf, is he still there or has he left? I, I know that uh, uh, our brother um, Abdul Malik Ali had to leave and check out of his hotel. It looks like uh, Sheikh Yusuf might have left all, as well or, or he was disconnected. So in, inshallah, Tala, we're at the end now. So I'm just going to close out and I want to I wanna thank uh, all three of the brothers uh, for... Um, here he is. 
Uh, here he is. There he is. All right. Uh, Sheikh Yusuf, I thought we had lost you, brother, for good. You got one minute, Aki. Just make a closing, share a closing thought in one minute, inshallah. I mean, all, the only thing that I can say, Bismillah, is that, uh, as, and I ask a lot of guidance to help us, is that we have to be more sophisticated in dealing with our struggles. Yes. And we have to, you know, uh, we have to centralize you know our principles but at the same time we have to understand each other and i and i i just i think that you know as long as the african american community continues to uh, marginalize itself and be marginalized we're not going to understand a lot of these issues that we're going through and you know that's what i i, I close with saying that that muslims have to be pro justice across the board and muslims have mm -hmm. to take seriously what it is that we're going through and, you know, and I just, you know, beseech the African-American community to, you know, reorganize itself, especially the elders, you know, and, and, and contribute back or else we're going to be in an ideological hole. Yeah. Allahu Akbar. Okay. Alhamdulillah. Thank you, brothers. Thank you very much uh, for your, uh, for your time, uh, for your wisdom. And uh, may Allah Ta'ala bless uh, everyone who was able to see this live and those who will see it later. Uh, to be able to take away from it, inshallah, to Allah, and use the information as a guidepost for, you know, what we need to do in order to become uh, more effective uh, in the struggle that has been placed upon our shoulders in this generation. Uh, I want to conclude with uh, a, a message, a poetic message to my Jewish friends who... who uh, uh, Who, who who may not have the ability to really see and understand the apartheid Zionist state of Israel for what it is, what it truly, truly is. Um, hopefully these words that were written in 1982, after the siege on Lebanon, instigated by the state of Israel then, and, and, and the catastrophe that it visited upon uh, uh, the Palestinians and the Lebanese people in the wake of that siege. Uh, this was my opening to uh, a deeper understanding of, of that conflict. And these, this, this poem was birthed from it. I hope it will touch the hearts of, of, of young uh, Jews whose hearts are in the right place, who really want to be able to uh, see positive change in, in that part of the world and in the world uh, at large. Uh, the, the, the poem is titled, Israel, O Israel, a nation of people born from injustice, causing great sorrow in all civilized among us. You claim your only concern to be your security, but your true intent is plain enough for everyone to see. There are Jews among you who detest what you do, but their voices are muffled and they seem to be few. You're proud and you're arrogant, malicious and clever. You seem to think world sympathy is going to shield you forever. Oh, but the bed is too short and the covers are too narrow. You can't see the handwriting for your scope is too narrow. Aggressive you've been since the day you were born from the anguish and misery of lives you have torn. Israel, oh Israel, where will you be when the pages have dried on your history? Bismillahirrahmanirrahim wal asr inna al insan Allah fi kusr illa ladina amanu wa amalu salihati wa tawassaw bil haq wa tawassaw bil sabr Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. In the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful, by the token of time, through the ages, verily, humanity is in loss, except those who believe and do good, and exhort one another to truth, and exhort one another to patiently persevere. Peace be unto you. Assalamu alaikum.